Good morning, HVAC team. We're about to get into chapter 17. Uh, chapter 17 is about refrigerants and their properties, which is a huge, huge part of what we do is uh, deal with refrigerant. So the objectives are define refrigerant, identify the type of refrigerant uh, by its number designation. Let me just silence my phone before people start blowing me up. Um, list the different types of refrigerant chemical composition. Explain the difference between compounds, zeotropes, and azeotropes. Describe the pressure temperature relationship of saturated refrigerant. List the different types of refrigerant contaminants. Explain the refrigerant safety rating system. Match refrigerants with the proper refrigerate, refrigeration oil. So a number of materials have physical and thermodynamic properties that make them suitable for use as refrigerants. In fact, anything that can boil at a low temperature and condense at a high temperature can be used as a refrigerant. That's what refrigerant is doing. Uh, inside of the system, it's boiling in the evaporator coil, which is 40 degrees, which is crazy, right? And then um, it's evapor and then it's, uh, it's condensing at a high temperature which is outside at the condenser, which is gonna be 30 degrees above the ambient temperature, which the design, um, the designed uh, conditions are 90 degrees, because that's when you turn your AC, all right, is when it's, when it's hot out. So you have 90 degree outside temperature and your refrigerant is going to use that 90 degree air to cool itself and condense it back into a liquid. Sounds crazy, but that's how it goes. Uh, that's what refrigerant does. Uh, definition of a refrigerant. Refrigerant is the fluid used in a refrigeration system for transferring heat. Uh, they absorb heat by evaporating from a liquid to a vapor. They release heat by condensing from a vapor back into a liquid. So to keep track of what's happening at what point in the system, it's in the name. They absorb heat by evaporating from a liquid to a vapor by evaporating at the evaporator. So pretty self-explained. They release heat by condensing in the condenser from a vapor back to a liquid. So that's how you can, you know, it's in the name, which component is doing what. It's condensing into a liquid and rejecting heat on one part of the system, and then it's absorbing heat and evaporating into a vapor on another part of the system. Condenser, evaporator. Um, a much larger amount of heat can be absorbed and transferred when a liquid is vaporized to a gas. Temperature pressure relationship. The pressure and temperature of any saturated liquid tends to go up and down together. If you know one, you can find the other. Charts called pressure temperature charts or PT charts for short, are commonly used in refrigeration. These charts correlate the saturation temperature and pressure of commonly used refrigerants. So the PT chart is something that we're gonna definitely get a chance to, uh, to play with. Um, I can probably show you one. I'm gonna stop my screen share for a quick second so I can find it first before I uh, go through all my personal files and show y'all the launch codes. And <laughs> Uh, let me see. Where is it? Oh, okay. But the pressure temperature chart is definitely something you want to get familiar with because every refrigerant at any particular pressure has a corresponding saturation temperature. And those temperatures are important when you're calculating superheat and subcool. And the superheat and subcool is important because it's telling you how your system is operating. It's telling you if you have enough or not enough or too much uh, refrigerant in your uh, system. But also other conditions can affect your superheat and subcool. So it's, it's, it's the backbone of diagnosing a refrigeration system, your superheat and subcool. Um, so, let me just find this. For some reason, I can't click and talk at the same time. I ain't that talented. Uh, do we have a PT? I know we got a PT chart. 
Boom. Found it. Okay. Uh, let me go back here. I'm getting real savvy with this uh, this tech stuff. All right, cool. So this is a PT chart, a pressure temperature chart for those who have not seen one. So we have a list of temperatures down the side, right? And then we have all these numbers in the middle, which are various pressures. And then across the top, you have a list or of uh, refrigerant. So each column represents a different refrigerant. So I'm gonna scroll down to the common refrigerants that we use. R22 is the most common, although that's being phased out. R22 and 410A and commercial and uh, residential and light commercial, that's what you're gonna see the most of. Um, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay, my bad. I thought y'all couldn't see me. I was just bragging about being tech savvy and here I go getting confused. But okay, R22 is being phased out, but most residential and light commercial stuff that's out there, um, it it was all R22 at one point. A lot of it has been upgraded, but you'll still see a lot of R22 systems. But anyway, so this column is a list of pressures for R22. So R22 at let's say 76 deg uh, PSI will have a saturation temperature of 45 degrees. So if you wanted to figure out your superheat, you would then, you would need one other temperature. You would need the actual temperature. Let's say that this pressure is on your low side, which is your suction line. Uh, you would need the temperature of the actual suction line and subtract that from the saturation temperature and that's how you will get your superheat so um, r22 at 76 degrees has a saturation temperature of 45 degrees but if we go to the 410a column and uh it doesn't have a 76 but let's go 78 so 410a at 78 psi will have a saturation temperature of 20 degrees. So notice that's significantly different. 78 is pretty close to 76, but at 76, R22, saturation temperature is 45. And at 78, 410A's saturation temperature is at 20. So every refrigerant has its, uh, at, at any particular pressure has a corresponding saturation temperature. And those temperatures are important when diagnosing. So you want to make sure you're looking at the correct part of your chart and you're looking at the correct refrigerant because the numbers can throw you way off. Your, your superheat and subcool will be way off if you're looking at the wrong number. If you have R22 in your system, but you, but you, Think it's 410, and you, you didn't, you weren't paying attention, and you got 78 degrees, and you, you, you're gonna think your saturation temperature should be 20, but it's actually 45, and you're gonna be like, what's going on here? But you're looking at the wrong refrigerant. Um, we got, we didn't get super deep in um, superheat and subcool yet, so I don't want to confuse anyone, but. Um, but that's what that chart is for. So one of the things that I love about having digital gauges, which we talked about on another video, is that the digital gauges has all the refrigerants programmed into it. So you can literally just push the refrigerant button and select the correct refrigerant that you're working on. And you gotta be careful to make sure that it is on that correct refrigerant. And it'll tell you the saturation temperature right on the screen. If you're on the wrong refrigerant, it's going to be the same thing like I just showed you on the chart. If you're on a 410 system, but your button is selecting R22, you're going to just going to read on your screen the saturation temperatures of an R22 system, but you're working on a 410 system. So you're going to be working with the wrong data and your diagnosis is going to be incorrect. So, uh, so that's what the pressure temperature chart is for. The digital gauges have that data built in as long as you select the correct refrigerant. We will definitely get a chance to get some hands on and play with all of these tools so that you can understand 
what they're used for in the field if it's not already starting to click, but it's probably already starting to click for some of you. So uh, <clears throat> moving on, so charts called pressure temperature charts or PT charts for short are commonly used in refrigera uh, refrigeration. These charts are correlated, the saturation temperature and pressure of commonly used refrigerants. I believe I read that already. Moving on. Using the pressure or the temperature pressure chart, to use the chart, find the saturation temperature in the left-hand column and follow across to that same row until reaching the column of the refrigerant being used. This gives the pressure of the refrigerant corresponding to that particular saturation temperature. At a temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, saturated R134A will have a pressure of 35 degrees, as we already uh, saw. So let's just let's just fact check that. It just said that 134A at 35 psi has a saturation temperature of 40 degrees. Let's fact check that. Uh, where are we at? Where's my PT chart? Oh, it's over here. 134A was up here. Boom. Wait. There it is. There's my 134A right here. Um, what did it say? My bad. 35 and 40. 35 and 40. Okay. 134A. So that would be this column. Um, 135, which is right here. And then slide over. Whoa. Wait, did it say 135? My bad. Again, let's go back up. It did not say 135. It just said 35. So 134A at 35 PSI gives us a saturation temperature of 40 degrees. So that's how you read that chart. Using the temperature pressure chart continued, saturated PT charts are very useful for determining the actual evaporating or con and condensing temperatures of the refrigerant in the system. Generally, PT charts will yield a much more accurate evaporating or condensing temperature than attempts to measure them directly with the thermometer. An R410A system operating at pressures of 118 PSIG, which is pounds per square inch gauge, that G stands for gauge, this is gauge pressure, a uh, 410A system operating at a pressure of 118 PSIG on the low side and 365 PSIG on the high side would have an evaporator saturation temperature of 40 degrees and a condensing temperature of 110 degrees, which is perfect because um, at 110 degrees on an 80 degree day, uh, we're 30 degrees above ambient at our condenser. 110 is 30 degrees above, but let me see, 90, 100, 100, yeah, so we're 30 degrees above ambient temperature and the coil being 40 degrees is right where we want it to be. So um, that would be a, a good operating system. Um, operating pressures. The operating pressure range is determined by the boiling point of the refrigerant at atmospheric pressure. The EPA regulations for preventing the release of ozone depleting substances divide refrigerants into three categories of operating pressures, low pressure, high pressure, and very high pressure. HC refrigerants, which are hydrocarbons, uh, the HC stands for hydrocarbons, uh, they make excellent refrigerants. In addition to being excellent refrigerants, they have zero ozone depletion. Um, and their global warming potential is very low. So the glow, uh, sorry, the uh, ozone, ODP is something that you're gonna see a lot. Um, when you get to the advanced models, ODP is ozone depletion potential. So HC refrigerants have the lowest ozone depletion potential because they don't contain any chlorine, which is what damages the ozone. So uh, unfortunately, hydrocarbons are not just flammable, but explosives. Um, Hydrocarbons are, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> are only approved for limited applications in the United States. They, have, they are more widely used 
in other places, including Australia, Canada, China, and Europe. Yeah, like propane and stuff like that. It's actually used as refrigerant in some places, but it is, uh, it is dangerous. CFC refrigerants. CFC refrigerants contain chlorine, fluorine, and carbon, which makes it a chlorofluorocarbon. Um, have the highest ozone depletion potentials of any group of refrigerants. <clears throat> Relatively high global warming index, long atmospheric lifetime. CFCs make good refrigerants because they are very uh, chemically stable. This stability is also what makes them an environmental liability. CFCs do not break down in the Earth's lower atmosphere. So they don't break down, they just stay there. And they, rather than breaking down, they break down the ozone layer. So HCFC refrigerants, uh, HCFCs contain hydrogen, chlorine, fluorine, and carbon which makes it a hydrochlorofluorocarbon. These are some weird words that you're gonna see in my 165. Excuse me. Um, so HCFCs have an ozone depletion potential, but it is lower than CFCs because HCFCs are more likely to break down in the lower atmosphere. The most common HCFC refrigerant is R22. Since January 1st, 2010, new equipment charged with R22 cannot be manufactured or imported and R22 is scheduled for total, excuse me, total phase out uh, on January 1st, 2020, which was five months ago. So R22 is completely phased out at this point. It is illegal to manufacture, sell, or even repair um, R22 systems. So don't do it. There's guys out there doing it, making a little money on, you know, on the low, but, um, what you're supposed to do when you encounter an R22 system is recommend an upgrade and walk away. They need to upgrade that system to a 410 system. That's all you can do for them. So HFC refrigerants, hydrofluorocarbons, contain hydrogen, fluorine, and carbon. Um, more environmentally friendly than, their, uh, than either CFCs or HCs, FCs, since they uh, since they contain no chlorine, absence of chlorine means no ozone depletion potential. So HFCs, my bad, I misspoke earlier. I said hydrocarbons were the lowest ozone depletion potential, but HFCs are, but somehow contribute to global warming. Still, that I'm not a hundred percent sure about, I, but I do know that if it comes up on the test, yes, they all um, contribute to global warming, but this one has no ozone depletion potential, so I still haven't connected the two. So hydrofluorocarbons, uh, re refrigerants, do not still have a global warming potential, or sorry, do still have a global warming potential. It has been illegal to intentionally vent HFC refrigerants into the atmosphere since November 15th, 1995. That date will come up again. I keep referencing Module 165 because right now we're learning the basics of all this, all the refrigerants and their properties, but this information is all going to be relevant again in, in Mod 165 because that's the module that prepares you for your EPA exam. And your EPA exam is all about refrigerants, the dates that they're being phased out, uh, you know, their properties. So my 135 and my 165 go hand in hand. It's almost like uh, part one and part two of the same thing. Uh, just you get deeper into it in, uh, in my 165. So zeotropes, a more common term that is widely used for zeotropic refrigerants is blends. Zeotropic refrigerants change in percentage mixture as they change state. Ternary blends are mixtures of three refrigerants. Binary blends are mixtures of two refrigerants. All refrigerants whose numbers are given in, in the 400 series are zeotropes. Azeotropes, uh, some binary mixtures of refrigerants will have one specific mixture ratio where the bubble point and dew point uh, temperatures are the same. 
these mixtures cannot be physically separated since the count since the components are evaporating in the same ratio as the mixture azeotropes can be handled just like compounds or pure refrigerants since they will not separate when they change state all azeotropes have a 500 series number azeotropes in a nutshell are blends of refrigerants that act like one pure refrigerant. Um, zeotropes have what's called a temperature glide because they're when they go through phase changes, they do it at different rates because there's different refrigerants in there. So there's a glide. There's a different. There's a range of of boiling points and and and, and, and condensing points. And then azeotropes, although they are a blend, they act as um, as one pure refrigerant. It just one boiling point, one condensing point. Safety. Refrigerants are grouped by their toxicity and flammability. Each refrigerant is assigned a safety rating consisting of a letter and a number. The letter A identifies refrigerants with the lower toxicities. The letter B identifies refrigerants with higher toxicities. A number indicating the flammability of the refrigerant follows the letter. The lower the number, the lower the flammability. Toxicity. Uh, A is used to, de to designate low toxicity refrigerants having a TLV of 400 or more. B designates um, high toxicity refrigerants having a TLV less than 400. Type B refrigerants are prohibited in many applications by building and safety codes. The maximum safe exposure level in parts per million is called the threshold limit value, which is the, what TLV stands for, the threshold limit value. Most common CFC, HCFC, and HFC refrigerants are listed as type A refrigerants. Many older refrigerants are type B, including ammonia, sulfur dioxide, and methyl chlorine. Asphyxiation. Most refrigerants are heavier than air and will displace the air in the room. Releasing large quantities of non-toxic refrigerant into a confined space can cause asphyxiation. This can sneak up on technicians because the refrigerant does not attack the body. Victims will become lightheaded due to lack of oxygen. This can be very dangerous in confined spaces. So that's something to be careful of. Um, one second. Oh, okay, never mind. Um, that's something to be careful of. Like if you're in a confined space uh, that's not well ventilated, um, it could be dangerous if there's large amounts of refrigerant leaking into that space. Um, again, non-toxic refrigerants, they're not going to attack the body. You're not going to feel sick. You're not going to, you know, be alarmed right away that something's wrong. But what it will do is displace the oxygen from the room, and eventually you'll start to have the side effects of that happening, which would be, like they said, the lightheadedness and, um, and, and suffocation. So um, if you find yourself somewhere where there's a large leak that you can't just stop um, easily, First thing you want to do is get out of there. Second thing you want to do is ventilate the space if possible um, so that you can uh, bring more air in. But oxygen, sorry, refrigerant is heavier than oxygen and it will displace the oxygen and it can cause suffocation. Ozone layer. The ozone layer is really just a concentration of ozone molecules within the stratosphere. Ozone is a form of oxygen. The oxygen we breathe, O2, is formed from two oxygen atoms. O ozone molecules are formed from three oxygen atoms, which would be O3. Global warming. Global warming is the gradual rise in the Earth's temperature because of an increase in greenhouse gases. All halogenated refrigerants contribute to global warming. In fact, the GWP of HC, uh, HFCs is gradually worse, sorry, generally worse than the, HC, FC, uh, the HCFCs that they replace. Let me just redo that. 
all halogenated refrigerants contribute to global warming. In fact, the GWP of H HFCs is generally worse than the HCFCs that they replace. Number designation. Adding 90 to a refrigerant number yields a three digit number with each digit representing the number of a particular type of atom. The first digit on the left represents the number of carbon atoms. The second digit represents the number of hydrogen atoms. The last digit on the right represents the number of fluorine atoms. Um, for example, look at HCFC 22. 22 plus 90 is 112. The number of, sorry, the number shows that HCFC HCFC 22 contains one carbon, one hydrogen, and two fluorine atoms. Since HCFC 22 has four bonds and three, uh, and three of them are occupied, HCFC 22 contains one chlorine atom. Compatibility, the effect of the refrigerant on the materials used in a system must be known. Preferably, the refrigerant should have no chemical or physical effect on the materials in which the refrigerant or refrigeration system is built. The refrigerant must not react with the deteriorate materials in, uh, that it comes in contact with during operation. These include metallic compressor parts, gasket, O-rings, seals, motor insulation and windings, piping and condenser and evaporator heat transfer surfaces. Contaminants in refrigerants. The only two chemicals that should be inside the refrigeration system are refrigerant and refrigerant oil or refrigeration oil. Contaminants frequently found in refrigerant, uh, refrigerant include water vapor, acid, non-condensables, carbon, particulates. Non-condensables in a refrigerant cylinder or in a system will increase the pressure above the normal saturation pressure. A refrigerant cylinder with non-condensables will have a higher pressure than, in, than is indicated on a PT chart for its temperature. So that's when I was saying other conditions can cause your, uh, can affect your superheat and subcool, which is affected by your pressure. Your pressure can be high or low due to other factors outside of how much refrigerant is in there. And this is one of them, uh, non-condensables being in the system. The best uh, solution for that is prevention. And by that, I mean, when you're doing an install, the most, well, it, the, the entire install is important, but uh, one thing to pay attention to is your evacuation. When you're putting your pipes together and get, you know embracing everything, you want to use good practices. You want to be as clean as possible. You want to make sure not to contaminate the inside of your piping by getting dirt in there or you know debris. When you're cutting, you want to make sure you do nice clean cuts. Use your deburring tool. You want to keep as as much as possible. You want to keep everything out of that pipe. And then once you put it all together, embrace it together. Um, then your evacuation is next. Your evacuation is important. You don't want to skimp out on that. You want to get to 500 microns or as close to that as possible because that's ensuring you that you've pulled everything out of that system. Only thing that should be in that system when you're ready to start it up is refrigerant and obviously the oil um, that's in the uh, compressor. So again, the way to ensure that is your evacuation. If you if you use good clean practices when you're putting your system together and then you do your evacuation and you get it down to 500 microns, then you can be sure that you actually uh, pulled everything out of that system and you can confidently go ahead and release the refrigerant and start it up. But um, if you don't pull a good vacuum or evacuation, um, you're, you're just asking for trouble. You could, you could definitely have non-condensable gases in your system and moisture and things that's, that you don't want in there because then you're going to be chasing your tail when something's not working right. You're going to be trying to, you're going to be tasked with trying to figure out what's wrong, even though everything seems correct, uh, but your pressures are off. So um, <clears throat> your evacuation is like a huge part of that. And also replacing the filter dryer. Whenever you open a system, 
Got to put in a new filter dryer. So replacement refrigerants. All replacement refrigerants must be evaluated and approved by the EPA. Substitutes are reviewed on the basis of ozone depletion potential, global warming potential, toxicity, flammability, and exposure potential. The program that evaluates new refrigerants is called the Scientific New Alternatives Policy, or SNAP. List of acceptable and unacceptable substitutes are updated several times each year. In summary, refrigerant is the fluid used in a refrigeration system to transfer heat. It does this by absorbing heat while evaporating at a low pressure and temperature. It condenses at a high pressure and temperature. CFCs and HCFCs have ozone depletion potential because they contain chlorine. HFCs have no ozone depletion potential because they contain no chlorine. So that is uh, chapter 17. Um, like I said, you know, this information, I mean, the entire course is important. So it's, it's kind of hard to say that, but I mean, you want to hold on tight to to your to 135 because that's going to go hand in hand with 165, and as far as getting you ready for your EPA exam. So um, again, study, read your books, all the information and more that we just covered is in Chapter 17 in your book. Chapter 17 has been assigned on Flexi Quiz, so go ahead and get busy, and um, stay safe, stay home, stay healthy. We'll be back in action soon. Um, I'm hoping by next month, I can't give you any exact dates or answers because I don't know, um, you know, it's in the hands of the health department, but we're making plans. So hopefully things will happen sooner than later and we can get, you know, get down and dirty, get hands on and really start busting these systems open and, you know, learning this stuff. So, um, as soon as we can, or as soon as I can, I'll be giving you all the good news and the update. Until then, stay, stay safe, stay motivated, and uh, hit them books, and I'll see y'all on the next one.